We take our first look at the Tesla Model X. We also talk about fuel economy ratings for GM's crossover SUVs, as well as the new GMC Acadia, next on Talking Cars. Hi, everybody, and welcome to Talking Cars with Consumer Reports. I'm Tom Mutchler. I'm Gabe Shenhar. And I'm Jake Fisher. Well, we've gotten a chance to drive a Tesla Model X. This one's a press car. We're going to have ours in, what, probably a month or two? Uh, probably a month, yeah, mid-June or so. Um, yeah, so very interesting experience. Uh, I mean, it's, uh, it's very, sort of, things are very familiar about it sure. because uh, of the Model S, but uh, there is, you sit high, and yet, uh, you know, it's not like a top-heavy SUV kind of feeling, mm -hmm. but that openness, uh, I mean, the windshield, the, uh, is extends from yeah. the, the from from uh, the regular place to like half the roof. Basically, it gives you such a feeling of you're like just a in a futuristic uh, canopy that's so airy and open. It's uh, it's really something. No, it's very much this amusement park like ride where you you can look all the way up and overhead. I, I think there's pros and cons to that in some ways, but it can kind of say that about the whole car, can't we? Or on about every car. Well, you can. <laughs> <laughs> There's more, more uh, polarization here, perhaps, on yeah, this exactly. car. Maybe not quite enough polarization in the windscreen. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting. I, here, here's my, 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 my first take on it was this. When the Model S came out, I was really taken by the Model S because when we tested it, it was kind of back in the time when Fisker came out, right? Mm -hmm. And Fisker was kind of... So a lot of people, I mean, they said Fisker and Tesla, Fisker and Tesla. They were, you know, everyone used no, them in the same sentence. No, no. Um, but it wasn't fair. Because Fisker was really all flash and not the substance. Whereas Tesla had a lot of substance and not a whole lot of gimmick on these cars. I mean, it really was very functional. Tesla Model S, I know we're supposed to talk about this one, but it was very roomy. I mean, they didn't compromise the interior packaging. It's a lift back. They had a front trunk. I mean, there was so much functionality with it that they didn't just say, okay, we're going to compromise it for gimmicks, mm -hmm. like the Fisker did. Now you go look at the Model X, and there's a lot of things on it which I feel is kind of like, it works really good to like show off to your friends. That I mean, certainly the Falcon doors, you know? I mean, yeah. they're, they're great to say, I mean, again, you know, I'm drop, picking up my kids from school, dropping off on kids. My seven-year-old boys, my seven-year-old and my 12-year-old, they think it's the coolest thing ever. Mm -hmm. But does it really make the car better? Does it really add a lot of complexity in motors and, and, and a lot of things? And there's so many things about this car that um, I just feel like they've kind of, you know, jumped the shark a little bit where they've kind of like gone from, let's just make a totally functional, really logical vehicle to hear some, you know, gimmicks to kind of show off your friends. The doors, let me, the front doors. Everyone knows what talks about the Falcon doors, right? Mm -hmm. The front doors, I walk up, you walk up to it, and it automatically opens the door for you. It gets well, that's in. because the, the door handles, they're flush with the outer body, and unlike the Model S, they don't pop out. You, pop, you push them in, and then the door pops open. Right, right. I mean, there's nothing to, gra there's nothing grab, to grab on. But, and, and then you go in there, and you press the brake, and it automatically closes. That is really neat. Again, if I was a 12-year-old boy, I'd be like, that's awesome. Um, the truth is, is that I can get into a Honda Civic and open the door and close it, and that works just fine. Mm -hmm. And when I walk up to this car... And quicker. And quicker, yeah, exactly. It's, it's a lot quicker. You know, you walk up to this car, and I, I feel like an idiot. Like, I'll oh, wait for my door to sense me and open me. Right. And this, one, like, this one, I push the door. It pops open a little bit. It doesn't pop open enough. You have to stop it before it hits the car next to you. Sometimes it's not open enough, so then you have to wrench it open. You know, just so many things about this car feel like a folly. And that's what I'm really bothered by. Yeah, the basics are fine. The, you know, it's, it's a Model S platform, you know, the Model S. Which is very, very drive. impressive. That stuff yeah. is all great. The car drives fine. Uh, it, mm -hmm. Actually, the car drives better than fine. It's a very sporty all driving right. SUV. Absolutely. It's right. just there are so many gimmicks here. It feels like Detroit in the 50s, which is probably <laughs> the last thing they wanted to, to, to channel. But it does. It's, it's so much flash. It's so much. This car is so overthought. When it, it comes is. to these doors, um, I mean, some of it uh, has uh, functionality. I mean, it, uh, the door—it's justification, be, I think. Well, because it opens with part of the <clears throat> roof, so there's less ducking, you know. But uh, there's not a lot of who, ducking into a normal crossover. I mean, exactly, I'll, a Highlander. I'll I can put a child seat in very easily. I'll just say, 
Ain't nobody got time for that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, yeah. again, it's you know, overthought. It's the, the door, the door sense. There's a ton of sensors in the door, so you, you want to get in. You don't, Who has the patience for this to come up? Well, yeah. there's a ton of sensors in the door, so you don't mm -hmm. dent the aluminum against right, right, whatever right. is overhead, or it doesn't, you know, whack you in the bottom of the chin. So if you're standing too close to it, it stops, and then it's like a. It's like a normal SUV with the power lift gate, you know, where you kind of have to wrench it open sometimes because it's it, it's not open enough, and right. it's just oh, it, it, but it goes beyond that. Some of the basic packaging of this car doesn't make sense. The second right. row seats are these monopod seats that are on just sort of a single pod, and they look like the the, the commander's chair on the star on Star Trek. You know, they're this one piece shell. Oh, There's not a lot of leg room in the second row. There's not a lot of leg room in the third row. Uh, the second row seats don't fold flat. Yeah, they don't fold flat. So ultimate cargo capacity is going to be really um, skimpy compared to another SUV. Right. We did we did this yesterday. We parked it next to our uh, P85D oh, right. or Model S. There is more room for a bike lengthwise. A, a lot more. I mean, yeah. I, I've taken my my mountain bike with you know you get with 29 inch wheels. You open up the Model S, you fold down the second row, and there's tons and tons of room. You go with this because those second, I mean, the second row seats are, they don't even, they, they do this. Yeah. They don't even kind of slide down at all. So you wind up just, you can't even fit really a 29 inch mountain bike in there without taking the wheel and off. And that's the problem. The, the, the sedan hatchback version of this car has more utility than the sport utility. Right. There, there's there's <clears> more <throat> cargo length inside. You can't put a roof rack on this because of the- I could put it on the Model S, You can yeah. put it on the Model S. It, the Model S has roof rack mounts. This, right. this doesn't. There, this can tow 5,000 pounds, but uh, come on, you know, the uh, range is going to be, gonna fair, be there, cut there is a, a hitch lot. for for these kind of things for skis and uh, and bikes. For skis and bikes, but not kayaks. But, but I mean, you know, I mean, look, I could, you could put a hitch on a Miata. I mean, you know, a roof rack has more functionality very often than just putting something on a hitch. And and, and you know, again, you know, range anxiety is always a thing when you're driving an electric car. And <clears throat> sure, it has a very long range. But yeah, if you're towing. That's, um, that's almost, in almost every normal car, fuel economy is cut by about half when right. you tow. So, so and, and, now and then, I'm down to just about 100 miles with this. Okay, and they're superchargers, but if you're towing... I can't, I, I basically have to unhitch the trailer, park at the supercharger, charge, go back, rehitch, and tow right. away. It all depends on how the superchargers are, are, are set up. And yeah, you're absolutely right. Depending on how they're set up, you may not be able to get there with it. Okay, a, you know, maybe maybe I can take my boat to a boat ramp that's 20, 30 miles away from my house. There are situations where this might I think work, they should add a, a mode to the summon feature. Re, 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 re my trailer. <laughs> <laughs> That would be that would be technology. They that's may be really working helpful. on it. <laughs> yeah. You know, also, the back of those second row seats, it's it's piano black. It's really glossy. But any cargo you put in the back that scratches against that, that's not going to look really good. So there's a lot of it's it's very attractive in terms. If you look at it in architectural terms or interior design, it's very slick. Very well, attractive. it's it, but again, yes, it's I the, agree. It's the, it compromises functionality. It's the Apple showroom school of interior design. Yeah. It's not the BMW 7 Series Audi interior design. This is comparatively stark inside compared to what you typically get for a hundred thousand dollars from one of the European luxury brands. Right. Yeah. That's. So, I'll say another thing. Uh, also, <clears throat> when you just look at it, uh, because of the placement of the door of the door handles, the rear door handles, mm -hmm. it comes across visually more like a minivan than an SUV. Had they placed those rear door handles mm. in the rear of the door, mm -hmm. I think it would be more visually appealing. I can see that. Yeah. Uh, to me, it's kind of like a, an overgrown Prius, the shape of it. It's kind of like that kind of overgrown egg. But um, There's something I really wanted to go back to. <clears throat> a big drawl of electric cars. and. When Tesla first came and talked to us, they, they made this whole thing about, look, you have an electric car that you don't have all the moving parts of an engine. Mm -hmm. You know, you right. have batteries, a couple motors, you know, you have, basically have an aluminum body. This thing can last a long time. It's really simple. There's not a lot of moving parts. So they've taken that quota of moving parts and they've put them in these doors. Sure. You know, they, they, they've Well, they've, and, not, and all the doors, right? I mean, there's so many electric motors in this thing. Um, you know, every seat that folds or moves, it's all mm -hmm. electric motors. The front doors have electric motors. And you're exactly right. So, <clears throat> you know, originally when we had tested the Model, tested the model S, um, and we originally got um, reliability information on it, it was actually average. It seems that, that have they 
as they've added that complexity to the platform, things are getting worse. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, our data shows that the latest models have the most problems. There's more complexity, more things on them, and as they add to this, is a problem. I mean, even the, the early ones, you know, exactly. I mean, they were pretty simple. Mm -hmm. I mean, we initially said electric cars at a, as a whole are pretty reliable, and they were, because they were pretty simple. In fact, the original Model S, I mean, kind of the only gimmick electric thing is those door handles, mm. which kept on breaking. That's right. But um, powertrain-wise, it's pretty simple. Now mm. they're not so simple. Right, mm -hmm. now they've added all that complexity to just about everything about this car. But, but I think <clears throat> maybe the, the biggest thing that I think about with this car is that, does anyone care anymore? Since they introduced the Model 3, since you have something like 375,000 pre-orders for that car, is the Model X just sort of this asterisk that just, I mean, well, it helps them generate you know more uh, money to you know develop what? the Model well, okay, 3. Okay. Well, I mean, don't under, underestimate the, the whole aura mm -hmm. that's built around the, the Tesla name and the Tesla brand. So uh, I wouldn't be so quick to, to dismiss it. I think uh, there, are, there are a lot of uh, loyal, it's, it's like a cult following that uh, the Tesla brand has. and uh, You just have to collect every playing card, basically? So and, uh, <laughs> you yeah, have to get I mean, everyone they get, make? Uh, Gotta catch them all. I, I can see people just say, yeah, it's okay, I had the Model S, now I want the Model X. Uh, I actually, it, it's interesting what, what, you, what you're talking about because you know, maybe it's just a flagship. So, I mean, you look at a lot of car companies, right? Mm -hmm. They don't sell a lot of BMW 7 Series or Mercedes-Benz S classes. They don't sell a lot of the flagships, the high-end model. So maybe the point of this is just kind of the test bed. You know, make this the tie-end one. This, I mean, this thing, I think, stickers, what, 150 grand or something? Yeah, this close. one, what we have right here. Um, you know, put all this crazy stuff on this, see what sticks, and then we can learn from that and trickle down to the Model 3. But then again, the model three. to the point of Mercedes and BMW, they sell a lot of um, X5s. Mm -hmm. And they sell a lot of, what is it now, GLS? Yeah, but this is not that. Uh, they're, they're not 150 yeah. grand. I mean, this, this is really, this is their flagship. And, and that X5 is not the, B, the BMW flagship. Mm -hmm. and, and BMW, Mercedes-Benz, they try stuff out on 7 Series. You're they, right. they, I mean, try it the out, first they try it out on lower volume cars. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. Let's and not another screw thing up the not to the, underestimate the is that insatiable appetite for SUVs <clears> in this market. And, and it's, it's a, also a worldwide phenomenon. So I uh, maybe, but it's a little, uh, it's so, a little so too when, close to a minivan. For well, me. yeah, like they, you said. Well, but when they trickle down to uh, lesser, less expensive model versions of the Model X, mm -hmm. maybe a shorter battery, maybe less features, uh, it, but it, I, I, it might I think uh, it's, gain volume. But I, but I, but I think, I think, I think what it is, it's the Model Three Sport version. It's the Model Three SUV version. I think that probably is what this thing is all about. Mm. It's, you know, there, there's, everyone's seen the Model 3 now, mm -hmm. but there will be a, you know, they talk about having an SUV version of that. Mm -hmm. And I think this is what they're going to learn on here, and things that worked and things that didn't work, they're going to find out. I mean, that, that windshield, that is the most striking thing. The, the that does not have cool. to be on a $150,000 car. I mean, you could put a windshield like that on a, on a Ford Focus. Sure. Right. You know, and, and some European brands mm -hmm. have actually incorporated that. And that is a striking thing when you get in the car. So let's see what customers think about it. Right. Let's add it. Let's talk about a more normal SUV. Um, GM has changed the mm. fuel economy numbers on some of their large, uh, they're called Lambda platforms, some of the um, Buick Enclave, the Chevy Traverse, the GMC Acadia. It used to be the Saturn Outlook, but that's gone now. Uh, they've changed some fuel economy numbers on those, and it raises more questions than it answers, doesn't it? That's right. So it, it's kind of the story keeps on changing. Uh, initially, they said there was basically a misprint on some window stickers for 2016. For 2016, they started the, putting these things out about 0708. 0708. Mm -hmm. And um, so they said it was a misprint. Um, now I think they're saying it's miscalculation. Um, but they lowered the fuel economy up to two miles per gallon on these things, which is over 10%. When you have low fuel economy, you lose two right, miles we're, per we're gallon. We're talking 16 and 18 miles per gallon. Exactly. Yeah. So what that means is a quite a bit of difference in terms of fuel costs. So <clears throat> I think we had we asked a question as soon as this came out. It's like, oh well, wait, there's got to be more to the story. 
So because they changed the numbers only on the 2016 cars, but in the last year of a model run, you right. don't make engineering changes to a car to make it less <laughs> fuel efficient, especially right. by two miles per gallon. So what about all those other model years? Are they right? What about right? 15, 14, 13, 12, 11? Are they, exactly. Are they right? I mean, the 2016 models did not get a horsepower increase. They don't weigh anymore. They don't have any performance changes. So it's very hard to believe that just those models in the last year suddenly got two miles per gallon worse. Um, so what about the earlier ones? And then beyond that, what about people who have purchased vehicles with a window sticker that says 18 miles per gallon? They've advertised mm -hmm. the fuel economy of these vehicles. And then lo and behold, it wasn't getting that at all. Yeah, because the uh, thing is we've this... been there before. <clears throat> uh, there was a Hyundai thing a few years ago, and right. they actually paid the money for that difference. The latest news, you know, as of right now, yesterday, those taping, they, they are going to compensate the owners who already purchased the vehicles, the 2016 models, who purchased these vehicles, thinking one fuel economy, getting another. The problem is they've sold <clears throat> well over a million of these SUVs over the years. The car has a reputation of getting, of not getting the fuel economy on the sticker. So, I, I rented a Buick Enclave last week on vacation, a front drive one. That thing barely got 20 miles so, per and, gallon. And every time we tested, we tested four of these versions over the years. Yeah. And they all got 16 they were never 15, better than 15 miles per so, gallon. So, so look, I mean, our, our fuel economy test is different, you know, certainly than the EPA testing, but it certainly is an indication because normally our fuel economy is very similar to the EPA numbers. When one really stands out like this one does, it is cause for concern. But the issue is the compensation. So they've mm -hmm. already said that they're going to compensate owners who bought the 2016 models. And there's a precedent that's set with you know, Hyundai and Ford. You know, if someone buys the car and they think they're gonna get this and then they get that, they're gonna get refunded. Sure. But the problem is, is that that may be maybe 100,000 vehicles. Um, the issue is that they have sold about two million of these vehicles over 10 years. And if you consider how much these people have driven these cars, um, I mean, approximately five years each, I mean, you could do the math, you get two million vehicles. Over five years, you're basically spending another thousand dollars worth of fuel. That's two billion dollars. Right. That so people didn't expect to have to two spend. Million, two billion dollars that people did not expect to, I mean, again, assuming that these, all these cars get two miles per gallon worse. Mm -hmm. That's two billion dollars these people have spent collectively, and collectively right. spent on fuel costs. So we'll see if GM winds up compensating people for that because there seems to be a disconnect. Well, in, I mean, right now they're EPA saying that those those that. those numbers are right. So I mean, I understand the resistance. Um, you know, we'll have to we'll to see what happens. We'll see. Meanwhile, moving forward, there is a 2017 Acadia, which is 700 pounds less, uh, lots of inches shorter. Um, we just don't doing know quick how many miles per gallon shorter. better. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I drove I drove a Press Acadia Denali last night. It was getting 24 pretty easily. Um, yeah, on my commute, it also got about yeah. that 22, 23. It's considerably improved, but it's also yeah. a considerably smaller car, isn't right. it? Right. Now, why? Why is it smaller? Well, the older ones were always at, uh, those tweeners. They were larger than the rest of the competition, larger than the Honda Pilot and, and Toyota Highlander, and now they're like right-sized. Mm -hmm. So they're like in line with the competition. And um, and the car is, I mean, the car is, is fine. It's competent. It's, it's competent, it's competitive, but um, I expected a little more, you know? I, expect, I mean, there's no eight-speed automatic there. There's no, uh, nothing really stands out in terms of, uh, of uh, a, a leap forward there. Mm -hmm. It's just where it needs to be. And that's the thing. I mean, the, the previous Acadias and, you know, that whole platform, I mean, it, it was a bit of a surprise, especially for when it came out. You know, this was a SUV that offered minivan-like interior accommodations, which is why I rented an Enclave. I had to haul seven adults, and it, they fit. Uh, you can't do that now in a new Acadia. You know, it is, it is smaller. It is like a Highlander or a Pilot now that has, you know, a, a, a third row seat just for kids. Um, but, you know, those previous products were this revolution. This is sort of a me too, I have to get, I have to have parity with the rest of the market and provide a product that's very similar to these yeah, other well, cars. For the time they gave you the functionality basically of a Suburban without driving a well, huge truck. Right. And well, I mean, now they're, you know, I mean when mainstream. they came out, let's not forget, I mean that's when they killed their minivan. So they had a minivan. This product basically they had a horrible minivan. <laughs> well, they did, but this product basically replaced their minivan, and that mm -hmm. was the thinking. 
But GM has always had this problem with these tweeners. I mean, we keep on saying tweeners. The problem is that they're not competing head on with these heart of the competition. They, they, right. they just threw out categories. their entire product line. All right, there is still nothing that is the same size of a RAV4, a Forester, or a Honda CRV. Look, look what's going on with Cadillac. Mm -hmm. You know, they've got something between the five and the seven series. They got something between the three and the five series. People want to buy a C-Class Mercedes-Benz or, or they want to buy a, a, a three series. Well, do I get the C or do they get the the one series, I mean, it's, they're just, they got to hit the, the core of the market because that's how people are car shopping. That's right. I mean, we, we just bought a CT6 <clears> and <throat> price wise, it's about the same as an A6 or a five series. Size wise, it's not quite the size of a, of a seven series. Or yeah, an it's S the class. same situation. So it's just, it, it straddles two categories. So it's like, they say they're trying to break the habit of tweeners, but they're, they're having a hard time in Cadillac, but it looks like they, they did it at least with SUVs. You know, with, with the Acadia. Well, yeah. With one SUV. Yeah. Well, with one SUV. Well, well, and they're on the way to do it. I mean, future plans, they'll have a RAV4 size SUV. Right. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's a product that GM needed to make, and it's, it's okay. Yeah, I mean, it's okay. It, it, it's going to be popular. A lot of families are going to like it. And the, the issue is that, again, you know, with, with that market, the, the Highlander size vehicle, and like we talk about the RAV4, I mean, those are such mature products right now because everyone else has been making cars that size for so long. Yeah. It's very, very competitive. There's mm -hmm. so many good choices. I mean, even you know, we even talk about the, the Kia, you know, the Kia the Sorento. Sorento. I mean, which nobody seems to know that exists, but it's such a really, really competitive product, and there's so many good, good, good things going for it. So it's not just being in the market. You got to go and be better than Kia too. Mm -hmm. Right. There's a yeah. lot of competition there. Yeah. That's going to wrap it up for this episode of Talking Cars. As always, we thank you for watching. We'll see you next time. Thank you.